Hi, I'm Carol Klepney, and I'm here with the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation. I've learned so many things during this time of pandemic. I've learned that there are time zones all over the world, and I am becoming a global communicator. One day somebody said to me, I'm glad to e-meet you, and I had no idea what that meant. I've met so many people through e the last couple of months. It's been amazing. So the first time I heard that phrase, I thought they said emu. And I looked around and there was no emus around there, no big beards. And then I thought they said email, but we were on Zoom, so we weren't emailing. So anyway, I'm glad to e-meet e you and to Zoom meet you. I wanna say thanks to the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation for inviting me here today. Um, I'm gonna be kicking off the presentations that I have to do with legal issues and financial issues. So um, I'll share a little about some things my family has done in that area and some successes we've had. So here we go. I live in Hermiston, Oregon, and it's famous for watermelons. So that's why I have the shirt on with watermelons to remind me of home. My husband and I have been traveling for the last three weeks in our van. And we've been some beautiful places in Idaho and Utah, and now we're in Colorado. Camping is a great activity during the pandemic. So we wore our masks and we socially um, distanced and we didn't really gather in any places where there were a lot of people like visitor centers or really popular attractions. And even though we did not take the opportunity to reach out to people as we usually do when we're traveling, some people reached out to us. So there's this one guy I wanna tell you about. The other day we were parked at the edge of a grocery store parking lot and I was standing inside the van and I turned around and there was a man there. I didn't get too startled and he said, my name is Chris and I have Parkinson's. His smiling face allowed me to answer him just a little bit sarcastically. So I said, you mean that degenerative neurological disease for which there is no cure? And he caught on and he said, yep, that's the one. I was diagnosed 25 years ago. Does this conversation sound familiar? Every time you meet a new person with Parkinson's, you have to go down the run and talk about who, how long you've been uh, diagnosed and all those kinds of things, you know? So this is how it went. The conversation between Chris and I continued and he asked me, how long have you had these symptoms? I was diagnosed 12 years ago but I had a lot of symptoms before then. I take Reiteri and I've had DBS. I had DBS also, and I continue to take 12 pills a day. How much? He says, and I respond, well, I take two cinnamons four times a day at seven, 12, five, and 10. And then I take Rapinerol four times a day at seven, five, 12, and 10. I take an extended release Cymbalta as an antidepressant and it helps with pain and I take an adult vitamin, vitamin D, magnesium. What do you do for exercise? He asked me. Well, every morning I get up and I do a program called Amy Says Dance, where Amy plays the music and we all dance for half an hour and then we share um, kind of like a little support group. After that, I am in Kimberly Berg's Rebel Fighters workout, high intensity, high intensity boxing workout. And then in the evenings, I like to ride my recumbent trike. What do you do for exercise? Chris says, I play frisbee golf and I walk. I walk a lot. There aren't any young people around here to exercise with. There aren't any people with Parkinson's who are active like me. So in this 10 minute conversation continues and I have a new friend and he gets a book for me. I wish I lived, um, I wish he lived nearer to others who have like interests. He seemed pretty lonely. And I wish he didn't live in such a cold place because he told me it's constantly about zero degrees in the winter and it takes a toll on his Parkinson's symptoms. Well, Chris reached out to me in his loneliness. He saw a sign on our van and he took a chance. I wish I had responded to Chris more with my thoughts towards 
um, this crummy disease. All of you are very experienced with Parkinson's. I really can't teach you anything new, but I can help you learn how to make it into an adventure. Make your disease and your issues, problems to be solved, a puzzle that you can put together. I was diagnosed at age 50. And at that time, like most of us, I looked at those pictures of that man with the stooped shoulder, his shaking hands, the shuffling gait. I'm not going there, I told myself, no way. And yet I sat in my recliner at home and watched the world go by out the window. I wasn't exercising and I certainly wasn't eating well. One day I just got really ticked at myself and I got up out of that chair, walked to the door, went down four steps, walked out to the post office. Wow, that was a victory for me. That was a long ways. But even better than that, I walked back to the house, made it back. Felt pretty good, just that little bit of exercise. So the next day, I came out of the house. I walked across the street. I didn't fall. I didn't get hit by any cars. I made it back to the house. Yay, another victory. I felt really good. So in the following days, I walked to the corner. I walked to the post office. I walked to my friend's house. And um, pretty soon, I was ready. And I walked the 500 mile ancient pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. I made it back. And then I wanted to do it again and again and again. So I've gone four times to Spain and France to walk and I put in over a thousand miles. Around the same time that I was doing all this walking, I learned that bicycling helped mitigate the symptoms of Parkinson's. So I learned to ride a road bike. You know, the ones with the skinny seats and lots of gears and you have to wear those spandex outfits that look so lovely on you, or on me anyway. <laughs> so we rode, um, first I rode a road bike, a regular road bike, and then I moved to a tandem, which I really enjoyed riding with my husband. And now I'm riding a recumbent trike. I loved each one of these bikes for a different reason, but the tandem was really special because it took us across to Iowa on Ragbride, Register's annual Great Bicycle Ride across to Iowa. And we went four times. Each one of these times was seven days, a week of riding. We rode for the Pelling for Parkinson's team and later it combined with Davis Finney team. Mind you, this is the last week in June, I'm sorry, July. The humidity was really high hills don't get you and the heat doesn't get you, then all the uh, uh, entertainment at night keeps you up, that'll get you. These were pretty extreme activities, walking across France and Spain and riding a bicycle across to Iowa, but they helped me learn a lot about myself with Parkinson's. So that's kind of an introduction into me. So let's get started on our topic for today. I'm gonna to talk to you about wishing well and doing well. Do you all have something to write with? Find yourself a pen or pencil, a marker, or whatever you can write with. And probably a couple of sheets of paper would be good. We're gonna be doing a little bit of writing today. So I'll give you a second to get those together while I have a drink of water. Okay, I hope you're back. Have you ever thrown coins in a fountain or a wishing well? My favorite time of doing this was when I was in Rome. And you remember the movie, Three Coins in a Fountain. That was my favorite. If you had made such a wish, did your wish come true? 
When I was in Rome at the Fountain of Trevi, I threw my three coins in and it did come true and I got to return to do it another time. So I would like you to imagine now that you have three coins in your hand and you're gonna to toss those coins over the shoulder, over your shoulder and it's gonna go into the well. Okay, are you ready? Here we go, number one, toss. Number two, toss. Number three, toss. Okay, now go over to the well and look down there into the bottom. And this is very clear water and you can see your three coins down there on the very bottom of the well. Now, you see the crank on the side of the well? I want you to turn the crank and pull up the bucket. Got the bucket up to the top. There's a piece of paper in there. Imagine, pull it out. Imagine a wish, your wish about your Parkinson's experience. I wish I had money to pay these bills. I wish I could go to that boxing class. I wish there was a cure for Parkinson's. Your wish. Now write a couple of words or a phrase or a sentence, but not a paragraph. Don't write a book either. Just a little something that's gonna help you remember your wish. And keep your paper nearby because we are going to be referring to it often. Should be writing your wish about Parkinson's. Okay, I want to share with you eight wishes for wellness. And these wishes are going to come in these in the manner of these words emotional, spiritual, financial, environmental, occupational, social, intellectual, and physical. First one we're gonna start with is going to be the intellectual. We all have unique gifts and talents. Things that we brought from our uh, careers, things we learned in school, things we were given naturally. I think Mr. Parkinson's is like kind of in cahoots with Robin Hood because he steals some of the richness of our life. He steals some of our memory and our motor skills and things that we really need to have. And when you're really down and you're really poor, Mr. Parkinson's might give you another gift. People have become songwriters and poets and artists and musicians and dancers all since their diagnosis. I became a writer. I didn't ever write anything before. And I'm also getting into sketching. When you foster your intellectual wellness, you are participating in activities that make you grow. Some of these activities that you are working on can be as simple as a card game, reading, doing puzzles um, and crosswords or Sudoku. Or you could try debating issues with others who have opposing viewpoints. Did I really say that? In these trying political times, watch out who you get involved in sparring with. Learning a new language we have some people in our support group who are learning Hebrew. <laughs> I haven't checked on them lately to see how they're doing with that. Learning a musical instrument, uh, trying a new hobby, are all ways to expand your mind. As are teaching and tutoring others, there are people out there that could help some, get some help with learning the English language or learning to read. Um, I decided to teach my friend's daughter to throw and catch a ball, to dribble, pass and shoot a basketball. And I did it in a very sequential manner and it helped her to learn and it helped me also. When you challenge yourself to learn a new skill, you are building your intellectual health. 
And people who pay attention to their intellectual wellness often find they have better concentration, they have better improved memory, and better critical thinking skills. So, you have your piece of paper there with your wish on it. How does this wish fit in with the intellectual wellness area? Take a, a second here and, and jot down a few words about the wish you made and how it relates to your intellectual wellness. Okay, I hope you've got it. We're gonna move on. Next, we're gonna talk about spiritual wellness. This is my home church, and it's very beautiful and simple and serene. It's a wonderful place to worship, to go just to pray um, or be quiet. The spiritual sense does not require that you attend a church or have any formal um, religion. It's related to your values and your beliefs. The spiritual wellness helps you to find meaning and purpose in your life. Spiritual wellness may come from activities like volunteering and helping others, or self-reflection and meditation and prayer, or spending time in nature. Signs of strong spiritual health include having clear values, a sense of self-confidence, and feeling an inner peace. Also, maintaining an open and curious attitude can help you find experiences that offer hope purpose and meaning. So look at your wish on your piece of paper. Think of this, how does my wish fit in with the spiritual aspect of me? Write a few words to remind you about this. Next up is financial wellness. Oops. There we go. Wouldn't you ha like to have those wads of $100 bills? Finances are a common stressor with everybody, not just with people with Parkinson's, but, as but especially with for us because they, you may not be able to work any longer and you might be worried about how you're going to support yourself or your family. So financial wellness is, is being able to minimize the worry over this aspect of your life. Here's some simple things that you can do just to save money. Um, things like having a household budget and not going over it, starting a savings account and adding to it every month, um, having an emergency account, cutting back on unnecessary um, purchases, avoiding credit card debt, I didn't realize how much I'd spent on coffee. We make it at home now. You can shop at thrift stores, utilize the library for free books and DVDs, cook your own meals instead of dining out. These all help when you need to save some money. Try tracking your spending for a month and see where your money is going and set your goals based on this. A couple of weeks ago, my husband went backpacking, something we used to love to do together, and I had to stay back this time. I parked our van in a campground, and um, I set out to enjoy a week by myself. One evening, as I was walking through the campground, I heard a, hi, Carol. I recognized that voice. It was Bob. I first met Bob over 40 years ago when I was a brand new speech pathologist right out of college working in an elementary school. I had walked into the teacher's room and there he was. And he introduced himself as a representative of an insurance and investment firm. He was a former educator 
and his wife was the third grade teacher at the school. He asked me about my financial plans and I said, I don't know, I don't have any financial plans. So um, the first product I purchased from his company was a small life insurance policy in case something happened to me so my parents wouldn't be stuck with my funeral expenses. What a crazy idea, but that's what I did. When Charlie and I married, Charlie was able to get some good car insurance. And over the years, we invested in annuities, IRAs, Roth IRAs, life insurance, um, and we pur purchased auto and home insurance from this company. Outside of that, we purchased some property. We had certificates of deposit, savings bonds, and of course, we had savings and checking account. We weren't rich, but we are, and can, we were and continue to be financially stable. I gave Bob a virtual hug and I think I made him cry because I thanked him for his advising us so well over all these years. Financial advisors don't get a lot of thanks, I, I guess. But because of Bob and other people in our lives, we have met most of our financial and, and illegal goals. We have our stuff together. We have our powers of attorneys. We have our advanced directives, our funeral plan, our plots purchased, our wills are up to date. You can start now saving and investing money. You can take care of all that legal paperwork so it's done and you aren't leaving a mess for your spouse or for your kids. I hope you'll carefully listen to the presenters today as they talk about these issues and that as they address topics from the legal area and the financial field. Okay, you know what you have to do. I want you to look at your wish. How does it fit in with the financial realm or legal wellness? Write a few words about that. Moving on. Environmental wellness. This is a good one to follow the financial wellness. Environmental wellness is um, related to your immediate uh, surroundings, whether they be your home or your neighborhood or your community. They can greatly have an effect on your life and how you feel. It can be hard to feel good when you're surrounded by club clutter and disorganization or garbage, or you feel unsafe in your neighborhood. Pollution, violence, garbage buildup, and water conversation, conservation are some of the factors that affect environmental wellness. We, as people with Parkinson's, need to keep our homes safe and healthy places so we can continue on living there. In our neighborhoods, we can um, help with community improvement. Neighborhood watches. I love to sit on my porch and watch the kids out on the street playing, but if they ever needed some help, I'd be there for them. You can plant personal or community or get involved in the community gardens. Conserving energy and water, it's important too. So you see a picture here of our home. Um, when my husband and Charlie and I were first married, we bought a real junker. Um, it took seven years for us to fix it up. And then we sold it. And we bought another place that needed fixing up. It was less of a junker though. We could live in it. So we lived in that home for 25 years and it was okay. But then I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. It probably needed some upgrading to accommodate my present and future needs with the disease. So we invited a contractor to come and do an estimate. He said, you might as well build a new home. It's gonna cost that much. So guess what? 
we had made the investment in purchasing some property and we decided to build on that property. The new house is just amazing. We have been in it for four years now. These pictures were taken before we moved in, so that's why it looks so clean and shiny. But um, it's full of things that I knew that someday I would need, and we planned ahead for this. The house is very open. We just they have two small hallways that are really wide. The doors are wide. Um, there's only one step to the outside. I have a dreamy roll-in shower, as you can see in the middle picture, with hand grips all around it. Um, I usually use a shower chair in it right now. Um, and it has a portable apartment size washer and dryer there, so I can take care of little laundry issues. This is truly a safe environment for me to live in and for the future of me. So it just goes to show you what planning ahead can do. I'm not saying that everyone should be going out and building a house. And city dwellers have different dwelling places than those of us in the country. But the point here is think about your future needs. What might you need to make your living situation safe? Might you be able to put in some grab bars, some handrails, start working on a ramp if you have stairs, removing carpets to have a smooth floor, plan ahead, get things ready for your future. So if you look at your wish now, how does it relate to this topic of the environment? Write a few words that will remind you about this wish. Now we're on to occupational wellness. Occupational wellness is a sense of satisfaction with your work. Or if you no longer work with your volunteerism. An occupational wellness goal might be to find work that is meaningful and financially rewarding. And that can be really challenging after you've had a diagnosis with Parkinson's disease. Finding work or volunteerism that fits your values, interests, and skills can help maintain a sense of occupational wellness. My occupational history. I was a public school speech pathologist. I wanted to move on the salary scale. And the only way you can do it in the public schools is by getting credits or through your advancing years of experience. There were no speech pathology classes out in rural Eastern Oregon, so I ended up taking um, some school administrators classes and I ended I sort of liked it. So I continued on and soon I found myself in an administrator's role where I supervised 50 people across five counties in the rural Eastern Oregon, quite a diverse region. I am sure the stress of that job was part of my um, contributed to me being diagnosed with Parkinson's. It was really stressful to do that. It got to the point where it was dangerous, um, dangerous for me to drive. Um, my anxiety was clearly affecting my work. So I called our public employee retirement system and said, what can I do? The kind counselor there said, can you make it one more year? You'll have 30 years and, and you'll be eligible for regular retirement. So I did, um, I did work another year. I left the administrative position and went back into a practitioner's position in the early childhood program. My employer was really good to me. They gave me um, extended lunch hours in which I, I went to a nearby gym and shot baskets, believe that or not, but that's something that really helps me with my stress. Or I would walk around the gym. I had a reduced work week, I worked four days a week. And they really told me if I needed to go out for a walk or anything during my workday, I was welcome to do that. Still, I couldn't continue on. The anxiety got to be too much. 
I needed to get insurance because as we all know, health insurance is really expensive. We paid it out of pocket to my former employer for two years until I was granted um, social, social security disability and my Medicare came in. What a blessing that Medicare was. Now my occupation is centered around encouraging people to live well and to have joy. I write, I speak, I draw, I play music, I love to travel. Um, I've gone to a couple of World Parkinson's Congresses where I presented some poster sessions. Um, I went to the Parkinson's Day on Capitol Hill, which you can see the, in the lower picture where I'm with our representative, Greg Walden, my husband and Nancy from Bend, Oregon. Um, we'd like to travel in our camper van and doing that, uh, during that travel, sometimes I'll arrange to have um, speaking engagements with support groups. Um, I'm an ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation, members of the Lions Club. I facilitate a um, group in Hermiston and the surrounding areas for um, Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. So I feel like I'm pretty occupational, oc occupationally well. Do you? Take a look at your wish. Does it connect with an occupation? Write a few words about that on your paper. As you've been writing these words, have you been seeing that the eight magic wellnesses cross over each other? Um, that some of them can be very much like each other? Um, I find this with the social wellness. Social wellness means a connection of um, connectedness and belonging. It means to have a healthy support group of friends. Um, it might mean um, doing some things with new people, joining a club or, or an organization. I already told you that my husband and I are members of the local Lions Club and we have been for years. Um, using good communication skills, speaking loud enough, um, some of us might be needing some speech therapy to help us have social interactions. Often we will find that our social connection is a support group or an exercise class such as pedaling for Parkinson's or rock steady boxing. And those social connections can be even more meaningful than the exercise that you're getting completed while you're doing that. I want to read you a story now of a connection. Um, this is a connection I made with somebody a couple of years ago. I am glad I have a friend like you, wrote Dixie a few days ago. I am too, I responded. Do you remember when we met the night I called you? I will remind you because there are a few things I don't want to forget. If I write them down, I won't forget them. I was home, alone, late at night. I told you I lived here in Oregon, which I had to teach you to pronounce. You acted like you never heard of the state of Oregon and made me convince you it existed. We laughed so hard. You were at your home in the countryside of Georgia, a couple thousand miles away. But as I recall, we were actually in the same place, in the city called Despair. It was dark there with no street lamps to light our way. We both were on the internet and discovered each other had reached out to the same social media site, the one 
where the late night parkies hang out, hoping to find someone with a lantern to light the way to our answers. I said, Dixie, if I lived closer, I would show up at your door with a bottle of Pendleton organ whiskey and two shot glasses. We would turn up the music and dance in your living room. We both laughed at the vision of this incredible dance party. I felt your hand that night, Dixie, reaching across the miles and taking mine. And I reached back across the miles and I took your other hand. And we have been holding hands for a long time now. I will never go tired of it. I add these lyrics to this song by Mary Chapin Carpenter. If you ever need to hear a voice in the middle of the night when it seems so black outside that you can't remember light ever shown on you or the ones you love, in this or another lifetime, and the vi voice you need to hear is a true and trusted kind with a soft familiar rhythm and the swirling unsure times. I'll be there for you, Dixie. My world circles around the sun each year. I, away, I age away. It's been 12 years since my diagnosis. The friendship of those living close to me has thinned. The ranks have been strengthened by others from a distance. I have been nourished by words, poetry, writing, art, dance, humor. I am content happy, and some days filled with joy. I never used to be that way. I was an angry youth. I complicated my life with unhealthy activities, but I always had a goal. That anger didn't leave me when I grew up, and with Parkinson's came along, I stuffed it down like I had so many other things. And the anger didn't start to go away until I knelt on a dusty road in Spain on the Camino de Santiago. It, and it wasn't gone after I broke open my heart walking in France. Some talk therapy, medication, changes in my life practices changed me. It was because I chose to do all these things that I did because I couldn't live with this baggage I was carrying and Parkinson's together. Now, I don't feel afraid. I don't feel guilty. I'm at peace and I choose joy. I change my adversities into adventures and I keep chanting my mantra of hope. Each day I set out to have the best day of my life. Time, it heals. Some more lyrics from the song. If you ever need some proof that time can heal your wounds, just step inside my heart and walk around these rooms where the shadows used to be. You can see, you can feel as well as see how peace can hover. Now time has been here to fix what's broken with its power. Thank you, Dixie, for being my friend these years. In this piece, I, I sought out the friendship with Dixie which was social, but it also, look at all the emotions I expressed. Now look at your wish. How does, your, how does the topic of social wellness relate? Write down a couple words to remind you. Physical wellness. Physical activity is like the number one thing. Everywhere we go, we hear medicine, um, exercise is the new medicine for Parkinson's. Everybody's asking, what is the best exercise? And the answer usually is one that you will enjoy and do. But there's more to that. You need to get your heart rate up, break out a little sweat, build endurance, build strength, Build flexibility, get some balance. They say you should uh, exercise up to 150 minutes a week. That doesn't seem like much, does it? When you add it all together. 
Healthy nutrition is important. So the experts say Mediterranean diet. Some of us have really unique dietary needs and we need the assistance of a nutritionist. So be thinking about that. Adequate sleep. What is that? Sleep is like the number one complaint of a person with Parkinson's lack of sleep. I hardly slept from the time I was diagnosed up until I had my DBS surgery. Why? There was pain, inability to roll over in bed and get comfortable, waking because frequent needs to visit the bathroom. All those things contributed to poor sleep. There are many examples of physical activity that range from just easier exercises with less intensity to more vigorous exercise. It can include yoga or Tai Chi, bike riding, jumping rope. I can't jump rope. I can't even get my feet off the floor. I've worked so hard at it. Um, boxing, engaging in sports, running and walking, uh, jogging, skiing, hiking, dancing, tennis, gardening, all those things are good. You see on the left here is a container for medication sorting. Monitoring our medicine is part of physical wellness. At the beginning of each month, I go through and I fill these up. And this container works really well for me because it has four um, little areas in it. And I take my medication four times a day. We need to know about our medications, what they do for us, and understand how we should take them. So please be sure you have that discussion with your doctor and your pharmacist. Okay, we're gonna come, come closer to the end here. I need you to look at your wish though. How does this topic of physical wellness affect you? How is it related to your wish? Okay, we are off to emotional wellness, saving the most important part for last. The history of our diagnosis of Parkinson's has primarily been based on physical symptoms. But we all know that some of the most um, things that bother us the most are the non-motor or underlying symptoms Things like depression. Depression is a mood disorder. It causes sadness and loss of hope. Apathy is when we don't have any motivation at all. We don't care one way or the other. We have a total lack of interest in doing things. Stress is a state of strain or tension, usually resulting from some circumstances surrounding you. I know when I have a feeling that I'm stressed, I will come apart at the seams. And it could be as simple as having to make a decision about where we're going for dinner, or if we're running late. I have a real thing about time. When I'm under a lot of stress, I can't think, I can't move. It takes over my body. Anxiety is the body's natural response to stress. But in Parkinson's disease, it goes over the top. Those flight or fight chemicals kick in and you run or you freeze. Help can be found. You need to talk to your doctor if you're having a lot of these um, emotional feelings. There's medications that can help. Talk therapy, visiting with understanding friends, breathing exercises, doing some things with your mouth like singing or humming or smiling. 
There's been research done that shows that you can't think bad thoughts when you have a smile on your face. Finding quiet time, being mindful about something you are doing, such as drawing or painting, or having meditation time can really help. Grief. Grief is ongoing. We've lost a lot. And each new thing that we can't do, we develop more grief. I am still grieving about home, rehoming my horses over a year ago. I had those horses since they were six months old. And now they were, they're 22 years old. <laughs> they're getting older and they required a lot of care and tension, more than I could give them. And it wasn't fair that my husband always had to do all that work. I grieve over them. Another thing, we had a great four wheel drive pickup with a camper on top and we named it Gertrude. We could go anywhere with that rig, but being a four wheel drive, it sat up very high from the ground and it took some climbing to get up into it. And once I was inside, it was a challenge to get up into the, um, over the, uh, over the camper, over the cab um, bed. <laughs> My husband was afraid I was gonna fall off of it anyway. Um, so we sold that and I grieve over it. I think my husband grieves over it too. But looking to the future of me and what my needs were, um, we bought a camper van, which now I can easily get in and out and maneuver around in it. I grieved when I sold my very nice road bike, but there wasn't any point in keeping it around anymore. I couldn't get on it. When one day I sat out in the driveway, had it laying down for over half an hour, trying to take my foot to step across the frame of the bike to get it up. And if I did get it up, I couldn't get my foot to move up on the pedal. It wasn't safe to ride it anymore. So we sold it and I grieve about that. As I watched my husband go into the wilderness with it for his backpacking trip a couple of weeks ago, I knew I should have been there right in front of him. Together we had walked over 500 miles of that wilderness and he proposed to me there. But my hiking was not going to happen. Not this weekend, probably never again. I wouldn't be able to carry much in my pack. Sleeping on the ground would be really difficult for me, getting up off the ground. And having to go to the bathroom outside in the woods would be a challenge. I grieve every day about these losses. But then I flip the can pancake before it gets burnt on one side. And I remember the good times. Those memories we made hiking and camping and climbing and riding and biking. Emotional wellness needs to take a priority in our lives. There's really truth to those sayings like, keep your chin up, look for the silver lining, make lemonade out of lemons. Here's a statement by Jack London. Life is not a matter of holding good cards, but sometimes playing a poor hand well. Life has dealt us all a crummy hand, that's for sure. I had a lot going for me in my professional life and my family life. And I could have just given up when I had this diagnosis. But heck no, Parkinson's was and is not going to beat me. I am going to play my hand well. And my hand actually has eight fingers. <laughs> Spiritual, emotional, physical, environmental, social, intellectual, financial wellness. Parkinson's can take, can't take away my ability to choose. 
I choose to make adversity into adventure. I think about this disease with a curious mind and I have a sense of wonder about it. It's, it's fascinating to me, all the things that Parkinson's can do to us. And I have a sense of humor. I'm gonna read you a, a little short story from my book about a, uh, demonstrating a sense of humor during my DBS surgery procedures. So uh, when I had my DBS, I had one procedure where they did the implants in my brain and I returned to have the implant in my chest after that. On Easter afternoon, we drove back to Portland for the next day's surgery to have the neurostimulator implanted. I have heard this device called many things, neurostimulator, generator, battery pack. Most often I called it the little box shaped thingy in my chest. It is the powerhouse of DBS. From the small device, electrical stimulation is delivered to both sides of the brain to help relieve Parkinson's symptoms throughout the body. The day surgery patient preparation rooms were identical to those in the neurosurgery, thin sheets blocking the view, but nothing else. The curtain was whipped aside and there was a young anesthesiologist, Dr. Alex. I was ready to tease him again. It's my favorite teenage anesthesiologist, I said. You're back. Glad to see you, Mrs. Klepney. We're ready for you in the surgical suite. What? No ID yet? Who's supposed to put it in? I inquired. It could be any number of people, but for right now, it's going to be me. Dr. Alex, tell me the truth. Do you put in IVs on a regular basis? Yes, Mrs. Klepney. I put in thousands of IVs you can be assured that I will do a good job. Dr. Alex put a rubber tourniquet on my arm. I showed him the vein that usually worked. With the needle, he proceeded, he proceeded to miss the vein and had to start all over with the IV. What luck for poor Dr. Alex. I didn't say anything. I was anticipating just the right moment to get him. Finally, he took the brakes off the bed and pushed me out of the pre-op area and round the corner into the short hallway. Are you carrying your medical license in your wallet, Dr. Alex? I started in on him. No, it's on my wall in my office, right next to my Eagle Scout certificate. He was on to me. As we entered the surgical suite, I called out to the surgical staff. Show time! <laughs> they were busy making their last preparations for my implant. Hey, you all need to be on top of it today. This surgery is really important to me. I am praying that you will do your best work. And I clasped my hands in fervent prayer, careful not to disturb the IV. And I will be especially praying for young Dr. Alex, who seems to be having a hard time today, especially with these IVs. For whatever reason, this brought out a roar of laughter from the surgical crew. Before long, I was on the surgical table where oxygen was attached and monitors were connected. Young Dr. Alex's masked face leaned down towards me. In spite of my teasing, he continued with his professionalism. Mrs. Klepney, breathe deeply and start counting down from 100. I started to mouth the words, by threes, 97, joking about the physical therapy tests I'd had to take, but no words came out. I was down in that deep, dark hole of drug-induced sleep. So look at your wish now. Does it connect in any way to this topic of emotional wellness? Last time, put down some words on your paper to remind you. I'm going to return you now to our wish, our wishing well. Review your wish and how it ties in with the eight areas of wellness.
These are wishes and only wishes. Imagine you're standing back by the wishing well. Take the bucket and lower it deep down into the bottom. Now, crank it back up. Instead of water in the wishing well, there's a note there with your name on it. Open up that note. It says, dear, whatever your name is. Mine would say, dear Carol. There are three things that you are really doing well. These are the three things. You can write down now three things that you are doing well. For me, it's reaching out to people taking care of my physical self, expanding my intellectual wellness. Those are three things that I'm doing well. So now you have your wishing well paper and your doing well paper. Keep those someplace where you can see them and refer to them often. You're doing well, you really are. And with the eight dimensions of wellness, you can do even better. Thank you all for being here today. You can add that into your doing well list because you care about your health. You care about what's going on with your Parkinson's. And so you came here today. That's something that's a good thing. Be sure to tune in and hear the speakers on the financial and the legal wellness. Keep it up, you're doing well. Here's a couple of pictures of me doing well. There's a crazy one of me in an Eagle Knievel bike kit, getting ready to be out on a ride, I think. The one on the left is I'm hiking in the mountains of Oregon. Here is a picture of my book, The Ribbon of Road Ahead. You can order it from Amazon. Um, it's on an ebook, so you can get that through Kindle. Or you can order it from me at ultreablog.org. Uh, if you order it from me, I'll package it myself and I'll send you um, a private note and autograph it for you. If you'd like to email me, um, I do answer all my emails. You can email it, me at ultreabooks at gmail.com. Around Christmas time, we should be um, expecting an audio book to be out and it'll be read by me. So that'll be really cool. I should tell you what the word ultrea means, U-L-T-R-E-I-A. It's a word I learned in um, Europe when we were walking in France and Spain. And it means you've got this. You can do this. You can go up and you can go further. It's a word of strength and encouragement. So I chose that to be the name of my um, book company. Again, thank you. Thank you for having me um, be your speaker today. And I look forward to hearing from you. Bye.